You can be seated. Just take a moment now. Let's pray together. There's eight words in that song that speak to our, our identity that I couldn't get past as we were singing this morning. My sins are forgiven and my future is heaven. Did you hear that, church? My sins are forgiven. You ever come to that place where you just say, God, could you forgive me? We know our sins are forgiven. And we know our future is heaven. You pray with me now, Lord, we are so thankful that those are the words that bring identity to our lives. That as believers who've called on you, Lord, you've transferred, transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. You've given us new life and you've forgiven us our sins and we have heaven with you for eternity. Lord, as we look at our text this morning, may that identity just grow stronger in us. May those days where we walk away from it, may we truly believe it and live it. We love you, Lord, and I pray right now that you would, would use this time together as we go into your word and as we open up this text and as we go to the table for communion. And all these things we pray in the name of King Jesus. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. My name is Joel. I'm one of the pastors here. And every now and then I'll be up here to preach. And not, more than one person really has, has come up to me and, and said, like, every time you preach, you always tell some road trip story. And, and I'm like, I'm sorry. I don't know. Just things happen when we're on trips. And, uh, and so I didn't want to disappoint. I have another road trip story this morning. Well, it's not really a road trip. This, this one was really more like a boat trip. And um, it goes like this. About 11 years ago, in fact, it was like 11 years ago to this week, I took a group of students on a trip over spring break to Brazil. We had some partners there uh, that we were working with. And this was our first trip to like this remote island. And there was so much travel involved to get there. We got on a plane from Atlanta to Sao Paulo, from Sao Paulo to Curitiba, Brazil. And then, uh, so there's two plane rides. And then we took a van ride to the coast. And there at the coast, we jumped on a boat. And we took a boat to another island. And then on that island, we got another boat. And I want to show you a picture of what that boat looked like, okay? So you can see and have a visual of it. Um, all right, so those are the boats we're riding in. And we have a 30-minute, I don't know, one hour. There's probably a few people who are on that trip actually in here, and, they, and, and now they're married and have kids and all that. These were students then, and, and they could probably even help my memory out a little bit. But um, we were riding in these boats 30 minutes to an hour to this remote island, okay? And so when, by the time we've gone through all this travel, we're a little bit crazy, and you know, you know how it works. Like you're tired, and you just feel like, well, what's just happened? And you're here. We're loading into these boats, and we're, we're, we're looking around. It's beautiful. Scenery is gorgeous, and, and we're just like, you know, uh, slowly making our way to get our luggage on the boats. But here comes this guy, and he is one of the fishermen who's driven one of his boats. We're, t we're loading up onto two boats, and here's this fisherman. Um, you can go to the next picture. Um, and he's like, this is him. He's like yelling, and he's, he's saying, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. Well, actually, we didn't know what he was saying. My Portuguese comprehension wasn't up to speed. But pretty soon the translator comes and he says, look, he's saying that you need to really speed things up because there's a storm coming. And I looked around at the sky and I thought, no way. There's no way there's a storm coming. I, when I looked up at the sky, there was not like hardly a cloud in the sky. But I said, okay, come on, guys, let's go, let's go, let's go. And, but very nonchalantly still, because we had been traveling, as, as much as I tried to hurry them up, you guys know how this works when you're trying to get somewhere, you know, we're just kind of, we're getting in, everyone's taking pictures, this is beautiful, nice, okay. And then we start on our, our trip, okay. And we're seeing, it's like, what, what storm? I mean, you'll see in the next picture, you'll see the clouds that were in the sky. There was no possible way there was a storm coming. And we're seeing this kind of sights as we go. 
And then about five minutes later, from a sky that looked like this, we, we are seeing a sky that looks like this. In fact, this was a picture I took right as we pulled up to the island. About five minutes before we get to the island, you start to feel the sprinkles. And, uh, and, and I think a few people had thrown up by then. The, the waves had been a little, <laughs> a little higher. And we unloaded our luggage and we got out at that island, and I promise you, it was not five minutes later when the skies just broke loose. And the winds and the waves were five, six feet high, crashing onto the island. Now imagine with me, if we had been in one of those boats just 15 minutes earlier, crossing the ocean, and the waves would have been like that. That's why our fisherman friend <laughs> said, let's go. And was so anxious. Now, how he did that, I have no idea, right? That's a whole nother skill. That was, I mean, they had no phones. They had no weather mapping. They had no storm radars. He just knew that there was a storm coming. And it reminds me of what we experienced there in that journey, the journey that we go on in the book of Matthew, and this, especially in this latter part of the book. That we go from what today is, April 2nd, Palm Sunday, we observe Palm Sunday today, we, we start Holy Week today. It reminds me of what we're thinking about as we do that today, of Jesus coming into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey. And you know the story, the disciple, he sends a couple disciples and they go and they get this donkey, they bring him to Jesus. He just tells them, hey, go get that donkey. It's right over here and there. And, and they bring a donkey. I mean, that's, that part of the story is crazy. And then he gets on the donkey and he rides into Jerusalem and people lay down their, their cloaks and their branches. And they're yelling out, Hosanna. Hosanna. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And John, in his gospel, adds in even the king of Israel. In Matthew's account, in Matthew 21, he asks the question that, or he, he states the question that people are asking, who is this person? And, and this is this glorious moment. Hosanna! Don't, don't, don't miss what's happening on Palm Sunday. When they're yelling Hosanna, that word means save us now. Please do save. So when they're yelling Hosanna, they're saying, save us. You're our king. You're our Messiah. You're the one we've been waiting for. We've seen what you've done, Jesus. And now is the moment in which you can now conquer all of our enemies. We've seen you casting out demons. We've seen you healing the sick. And now it's time for the political side of your mission to start. To come in on a war horse, and come and conquer our enemy, the Romans. But Jesus never follows the path in which we would have laid out for him, right? He always takes corrective action. There's, when, when the people start to begin to like, put him up on this pedestal to, to say, this is going to be our conquering king. In uh, John 6, there's, a, there's the story that would be quite familiar to a lot of you where he feeds 5,000 with basically like a happy meal, right? He, he gets <laughs> the bread and the fish and he just multiplies it and feeds all these people. And afterwards, this miracle is so great that afterwards he says, or, or I'm sorry, the people say, let's make him our king. There's whispers of that all around. And Jesus, in John chapter 6, he says this, or it says this about him, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So Jesus will have no part in their, in their plans and what they want to do to set him up as king. Now I'm bringing all this up because our series is called The King. We're looking in Matthew at all these, this thread that runs through the gospel that says Jesus is the king. And if you trace that thread, I mean, it's quite amazing, and, and we're going to trace it all the way to our text today, Matthew 26 and 27, and we'll see it even in the cross. But I want you to think about with me for a second what it would have been like to experience that whole week. 
my wife and I looked at each other on Friday, and we said, it's been a long week. <laughs> it's been a long week. Maybe a few of you felt the same way. Like leading into, if, for those of you who have spring break this week, I don't know, it just feels like there's a lot packed in to, to like taking time off like that. It was a long week for our world, for our country. It's back to what happened just earlier this week in Nashville. Man, I wept this week. Personally, it was a long week, various things going on in our life. My wife has been working on some legislation. There was all kinds of stuff going on with that. We had sick kids. There's lots of things that I'm working on right now. It's a long week. But imagine how that, how even our longest week would have compared to what Jesus experienced. He comes riding into Jerusalem. The people want to make him king. And you would think, this is all sunshine, this is all beautiful, this is all good. But he knows there's a storm coming. It was like our fisherman friend there on our trip to Brazil. He knew when no one else knew that we're about to get in this boat and there is a storm coming. And even as Jesus rides into Jerusalem, he knows that what will ultimately happen there is not what anyone else is envisioning at this point. Even that choice for him to ride in on the donkey with his feet up off the ground, the disciples, as they were writing the Gospels, they remembered back to what it said in Zechariah 9. It says, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey. And so the question for us is just, what kind of king is this? kind of king is this and now fast forward all the way to the end of the week and in just five days we will have gone from the people celebrating Jesus to the people crucifying Jesus as we look at this text I want you to see four things about Jesus and his royalty I want you to reflect on four things in which we see Jesus reigning in this text. Let's go to Matthew 26 first. And in our first scene, we have Judas coming to Jesus to betray him. <clears throat> we pick it up in verse 49. And Judas comes up to Jesus and at once says, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, friend, do what you came to do. And they came and they laid hands on Jesus and they seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Verse 52, and Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? All through Jesus' betrayal, his arrest, his trial, and now we'll see in his crucifixion. And all those events, here's what I wanted to show you this morning. Jesus reigns as king. And in the first way, in this particular event, and in all the events really, you'll see that You'll, you will see that in that his control was over all the events that unfolded. One thing that the gospel writers make clear, both in the way in which they tell their stories and in the ways they sometimes outright say it, there's no doubt who's in charge. Jesus is in charge. In John chapter 10, uh, Jesus says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. But I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it back up again. And here in this instance, you see him say this there during that arrest in verse 53. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send me 12 legions of angels? 
He, he doesn't need that much. It would just take a few angels, really, to take care of this little battalion that had come after Jesus. And Jesus says, no, I, I could do much more. I could have a legion of angels for each of my disciples at my disposal right now. But that's not what's happening. We have Judas abandoning him, betraying him. Imagine what that would have been like here in this moment. But even in those events, Jesus is in charge. We go next to, we'll skip ahead to, to verse 62. Peter will abandon him in between there. Jesus is eventually going to end up completely alone. In verse 62, the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? Jesus is on trial now. It's the middle of the night, and Jesus remains silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. It's amazing, Jesus almost remains entirely silent as we track through his trials. First here in the middle of the night with the Jewish trial, and then next in the morning in Matthew 27. Look at verse 11, Matthew 27. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, You have said so. And that's literally all he, he says, because in verse 13, Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things that they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed through all these events Jesus remains almost entirely silent and in that I believe we see his kingly authority we see it in the way that he is silent even in the face of his accusers because the fact is get this Jesus is not on trial. No matter what it looks like to us, in reality, it's the high priest who's on trial. In reality, it's Pilate who's on trial. In reality, it's all those people who will eventually call for him to be crucified who are on trial. It's us who are on trial. Because we're going to be able to stand back and look at this text as a whole and see that this is the plan of God unfolding. And in this plan, Jesus is demonstrating who he is. And he has no reason to speak up. Because these events are unfolding just as he had planned. And so we see his kingship even in the silence in the face of his accusers. And the third way we see his kingship is when we see his mockers become his confessors. The next part of this text in verse 27, it, the soldiers, I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit right here. The soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion. And they stripped him and they put on a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Mocking him. They spit on him. They took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. Imagine the humiliation here. Imagine the physical beating here. And all the while, Jesus is being mocked. <laughs> it's like, it blows your mind, right, to think that here's Jesus, the true king, the one who has given these soldiers life and breath, and they sit here and mock him. And they put him on on trial. They put that reed in his hand, that crown of thorns and a scarlet robe, and they parade him around. And it's not just 
the soldiers, but in the next sequence here, you'll see in verse 37 that over his head as they put him up to be crucified, they wrote a charge against him which read, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. That wood plaque that they would give to all the criminals would have written on it their criminal charge, what they were being executed for. And it was meant to be a mock of Jesus, that he was the king of the Jews. Do you see the irony here? And if you, if you keep going, you have the robbers who are mocking him. And then verse 41, so also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders, they mocked him saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. These mockers, the soldiers, the chief priests, the scribes, the, even the, even the uh, thieves, in their mocking, they actually, ironically, become true confessors. Now what they mean is not true, true but what they say is. And I think even in that, we see the kingly authority of Jesus as he's on the cross. Verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Here's the last thing I want you to see here. Jesus reigns from the cross. And you see it in his steadfastness and power until the very end. In verse 50, Jesus cries out again and with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Death did not steal Jesus away. We see his power even here in death and the fact that very precisely this word was used, yielded up. Jesus gave his life. He laid it down. Here's where I think we can get it wrong when we look at the cross. When we look at the cross, we can say, wow, I just wish it hadn't gone down like that. We can look at Jesus and say, he surely was the victim in this. In this sham kind of trial and all these crazy accusations that the people give him. We can look at Jesus as a victim, but that's just not true. That's not the theology that's spelled out by the Gospels. Jesus was not a victim on the cross. Jesus was a victor even on the cross. He was not a defeated criminal. Jesus was a triumphant king. On the cross, he was a triumphant king. One of the writers I read this week, Michael Green, a New Testament scholar, says it like this. His, meaning Jesus, royalty is not, so to speak, a reward after his suffering. It is part of his suffering. And it shines out through his suffering. He was regal on that cross. The king has come to Israel and even the cross cannot mask his grandeur. The cross was not something for Jesus to just get through to get to the other side. It was on the cross in which Jesus was unfurling his kingdom, establishing once and for all the true nature of his kingdom. That even in his death, he reigned. So here's the point. I'm trying to drive home all the way to right now. Jesus reigns through it all. Is that good news? 
Jesus reigns through it all. If you think through his hurtful betrayals, if you think through the prejudicial trials, if you think through the offensive mocking, if you think through his horrid torture and his excruciating death, Jesus reigned. And if he reigned through all of those things and he even reigned up on the cross, then certainly he reigns as the risen Christ right now and forevermore. That's the good news for you this morning. That's the good news for me this morning, that Jesus reigns through it all. No matter what situation you're in, no matter what you're going through, Jesus reigns. Because he reigned on that cross. Just quickly try to get to the end here. We're going to take communion in just a minute. But first, I think it's really important that I take you back just a couple steps in the the sequence of the story to where Jesus is before Pilate, and Pilate says, here's a choice. You can, we can either release Barabbas, or I can release Jesus. You know, Barabbas' name was actually Jesus Barabbas. There's two Jesuses that were, that were uh, here, and one of them was going to go to the cross. Jesus Barabbas, his name literally means Jesus, son of the Father. And then we have Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. And Pilate says, who should I release, Barabbas or Jesus? This Jesus or this Jesus? And what's amazing about this part of the story is we get a picture of what Jesus does for us on the cross. Because the people are stirred up by the chief priests and the Pharisees and scribes. And they call out, release Barabbas, crucify Jesus. And in doing so, Jesus, who has committed no crime, Jesus, who has lived a perfect life, goes to the cross, the cross that was meant for Barabbas. He takes the place of more than likely a murderer and a thief and all the things you would write up the book. That's our story. If you know Jesus, he lived a life we could not live. He lived a perfect life. And he went to the cross, the cross that we deserved, all of us as sinners who have turned away from God and gone our own way. He took that cross, he took our cross, and became the substitute on our behalf. That's what he did for you and I. And if you've never trusted in Jesus for salvation, I'm going to encourage you to to call on him today, the king who reigns through it all. The king who would not let anything stop him from getting to the cross so that he could take our place, our sins, so that we could be in relationship with him. Let's pray. I'm going to give you a moment to reflect right now. If you want to call on Jesus for salvation, do that right now. You just call to Jesus and you ask him to forgive you of your sins, to put your trust in him that he died on your behalf, and ask him to be king of your life. You need to talk about that more. You can talk about that with me, with Maybe someone else you know here this morning. And we would love to help you take those steps with Jesus. We're going to have a moment right now to just reflect on Jesus as we prepare for communion. To reflect on his death. To reflect on us. Not just seeing him as a victim, but as a victor. To us to see him as king. I want you to do that right now as we prepare for the table.